Yeah, there's these three wise men that report to the king in categories of what games are, and they they connect it with certain virtues. And mm -hmm. so there is chess <clears throat> oriented around strategy. And it's a story from India, correct? At least that's how King Alfonso reports it. Yeah. Yes. And so there is chess that is strategy, dice that is luck and fortune, and then tables, which I took as I read, it's kind of like a backgammon type game where you've got a board and dice. So it's kind of a marriage of the two. That is prudence. Or mm -hmm. we might call dice mitigation. So how to avoid bad rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's the three that present. Well, I forget why is he asking what are the what prompts them? Do you recall? I think I he's like asking, them. you know, like what what makes for kind of what makes for a good life or what what's most important in life. I think or something okay. like that. And the and the first one says brains is most important. And the second one says luck is most important. Right. And the third one says so it starts prudence. with the virtues and then shifts yeah. to the games. And then they they produce these games as kind of an illustration of their point that, mm -hmm. um, or they bring forth these games to the king as an illustration of the point that game that chess shows the brains is most important. Dice shows that luck is most important. And then tables or like you say, kind of we might say backgammon today shows that a balance of the both of, of mm -hmm. both is most important kind and of it's so cool because it makes me think of euro type games as brains where there's yeah. minimal luck yeah. and there's planning and strategy uh although chess i guess does have an ameritrash idea of i have to eliminate you for me to win so it's not yeah. quite the yeah. same so but the dice mechanic would be more of a monopoly a mare trash thing where it's a lot of it, it can be a lot of luck or the craps table where it's just uh, what numbers can you roll and what sequence and that's yeah. what the book describes a lot of and then the table games is a nice marriage of them so yeah it's it's cool that we still kind of think in those categories yeah it really is after all these years that they, they still apply it's cool to see and to hear yeah and, um, and of course we strategize and that's part of life we have luck and fortune that some people get lucky in life and some people get unlucky, whether it's lottery ticket or, you know, just having good timing, good luck, good fortune. And then the idea of mitigating disaster in the table games. Yeah. So that makes me think of the idea of insurance. Like you keep insurance. So if something mm. bad happens, you're not wiped out in terms of value of your house or your car you know, or something like that. That's a good yeah, so disaster mitigation. That is a good parallel. Yeah, and I'm I like bad that. at those types of games. I do have insurance, <laughs> but I'm bad <laughs> at those types of games because I get so excited about rolling the dice. And part of it, you do have to, you know, what do you do if you get the worst possible roll? What are you going to do? Right, right. Yeah. And yeah. so like in Arc Nova, there's a little bit where you can, well, I guess there's not dice, but yeah, that's a bad example. Never mind. No, I no, guess no. if you're not paying attention in the card order, then the little X things are a way to mitigate what situation you're in. Right, right, right yeah. That you can the, empower a card. Those are little tokens that allow you to have a little more control over your circumstances, yeah. And in theory, you could have mapped it out. There's, I think most people can't map out, but so many level, so many turns ahead yeah, and so yeah. so you get those X's is kind. Of, that's probably where I was thinking. It's sort of an insurance that if you find yourself stuck, or there's a car, or I guess the luck is when the what cards are dealt or come out. There's a card you particularly want. You might have the it might help you avert the disaster of not getting that game, that getting yeah. that card or something. So yeah, they, they it does it does really parallel. Yeah, you're right. A lot of conversations I think we've had here on this podcast, but just in in other circles too, in spiritual religious matters, you know, this, these questions of, you know, what, what can you control in your life? You know, what, what do you have the ability to strategize for, mm -hmm. or to think about, or to, um, to think through what can't you control in your life? And, uh, and then how can you kind of bring those two things together? You know, how, how can you, how can you, um, kind of build upon what you can control in the face of what you can't control, cannot control. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's it's easy to pick on the mor moral moralizing elements of some of the Victorian games or even this, that they bring these things in. But I kind of disagree. Like, I think, I think morality is so important. And t even teaching children, you know, opportunity. 
we all want our kids to be good people and to thrive in this world. And opportunities to teach that are not bad things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it depends on what morality and how you teach it and how you deal with failure and things. But, but I, I'm sympathetic to connecting games with some sense of morality and, and goodness mm -hmm. and fairness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I've watched some shut up and sit down video. they have some history with, there's a scholar in England that they've featured that's talked about some of the Victorian games. Oh, and they were, you happen to remember that person's name. It's okay. If not her name is Ford Hyundai escape tire. Nice. No, I'm just looking out the window. I know I, I can't. Remember. I have driven her cars too. Yeah. She's, yeah she's Bechamel great. grass tree bark. No, okay, I, that's I fine. That's fine. Yeah. No, that's fine. sorry. No, no worries. Not, no worries. Thank you. I told you my RAM uh, memory banks were low. No, I can't. But if you look in you some did. of the history of board games, she, she they featured her a time or two, and she I think is a maybe at one time as a PhD student, sort of studying okay. those sorts of topics. Okay. And I appreciate her critiques, and, and it's fair to say, you know, look how the Victorians were trying to inject ideas of gender and morality into everything. I get that. But I also, part of me is, as a parent, I'm like, you know, maybe they're also just trying to make sure their kids were going to uh, thrive and be just people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think as we've talked about before on, on this podcast, you know, that games can be safe places where you practice life skills, you know, and where you think right. through, they can be safe um, microcosms of the larger world mm -hmm. to try things that some of them will work, some of them won't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, yeah, like learning how to deal with loss and, you know, and, and, and mm -hmm. not winning and, and uh, cooperating and yeah. Yeah. And, and actually along those lines, one of the bits of five counts, the West kingdom, and they do this in a, in architects as well, there are criminals you can use oh. and they can give you power ups, but then they have certain negative consequences. So you really want to skate the element of going to the dark side of the force, but not for too long. <laughs> okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> because you'll get stuck and then you can't do some things because you've hired too many criminals. Interesting. But a few criminals can be okay. You can get a little, a little bit, a little bit. That's so Because you played architects, right? Yeah. And there is, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so that. it's that idea. Yeah. That. You use the criminal yeah. stuff or yeah. the black market and then you can't build the church at a certain point because you have If you go too far, then you're gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. There's a little bit of that there. I mean, you, yeah. if you think about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so then getting back to the board, the book of games from that point, then after kind of laying out this schematic for understanding games these three categories of games. Uh, then the book goes on to basically catalog. Um, I, th I think I read, I didn't count them, but I think I read 144 games that fall across those three categories. And then a few extra at the end. It struck me that this was kind of like the board game geek of the Middle Ages, right? That it was like, yeah. if you had a question of what a game was, you looked it up in Alfonso's book of games. And, um, and they were all, almost all of them, variations of chess mm -hmm. and of dice and of tables or backgammon, we would say, mm -hmm. but then a few extra thrown in at the end. Some of those variations were really interesting. Like, you know, because the, the book is, is illustrated too, um, with these really fascinating illustrations and like these massive chess boards, you know, that are, that have, mm -hmm. um, many, many more pieces than we do. And, and chess played with, uh, with elephants and giraffes. I mean, not, not really. Dice. Little, they mentioned but, playing dice somehow. And I was yeah. not clear how you do that. Yeah, but I guess yeah. it takes some of the strategy out. But that yeah. also reminds you that the idea of new additions or expansions has been around for a long time. That yeah, somebody's going to play with the rules. Like, well, great what point. if we did it this way? Or what if yeah. the elephant? And in fact, at this time in the book of games, there is no queen for chess. I noticed that. Yeah, it was called, um, oh, what was it? Like a... It's, the fair. Uh, it's uh, called Daniel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have not lived up to that name. Yes. Um, but yeah, like the, you're right. There was no queen. There was this, uh, like it was called. I forget the exact name, but it was it was like the banner holder or the like the yeah something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, so yeah, I think I mean that's kind of the uh, an overview of the book. Because said Kevin and I are going to kind of share in some responses to it, but does that seem does that seem to capture the overview of it fairly well? 
Can I yeah, anything out? I, I think so. I mean, it does seem to focus on chess for the most part. Yeah. Probably because of the various chess problems you can do, which I remember as a kid, they were in the newspaper. If, if you have, you know, how would you solve this scenario? How would you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. play through this bit? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I appreciate the structure. And you're right about the board game geek thing. It is kind of a ranking and a possibility and listing. So it's really, really pretty yeah. neat. And then it's got this comic book element that the art is connected with the text. Yeah. And yeah. both uh, furthers the tech. It illustrates, but furthers the text as well. And can actually, there's uh, this one scholarly article points out there's there's some jokes going on in the artwork. So it mm -hmm. at times is is mm -hmm. suggesting something different from the words. And as you pointed out to me in, in, in our, that, that article, um, you know, there's a, it's a, there's a pretty wide diversity of people playing these games too in their yeah. illustrations. You know, it's a, men and women and people of all different skin hue complexions and backgrounds. And it was, um, it's neat. It's interesting. But um, one group that's absent, but I'll, I'll get to that in my, in my, in my takeaways, one of my takeaways. Um, so before we get to our takeaways though, um, should we do a little, a quick little game break? Kevin, just to talk about game break, game, game break, break, game Woo break. A time for a game. We need a little j ditty there. What's a game where we just kind of talk about maybe a game that we've especially been enjoying right now? And Kevin, what's a game you've been enjoying right now? What's a game you know well because I stole it from you, and that's called <sighs> Arc de Nueva. Is that Arc where it went? Nova. Yes, yes no, I, I love your command of talking. Spanish. Yes. Uh, yeah, Arc Nova. I have taught it to the kids. Jenny hasn't played it yet. She she protests the fact that we're always trying different games, and it mm. annoys her. So I think she's holding out. She's like, "No, we must play something I know." I'm tired of learning something new. But the kids, I had to strong arm that. one of them. I really had to push him. Um, I kind of lied to him actually. He, he's like, "How long oh. does a game take?" And I was like, "Ah, oh, forty minutes." <laughs> <laughs> I think he knew I was lying. But yeah, they all enjoyed it. It's such a great game, and it's such it's 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 ranked so highly now, despite uh, being only out a year, which is pretty unusual. What do you enjoy so much about it? I agree, I love it. It's just um, it's it's an uh, engine builders are always fun. So you're trying to build the zoo, and, and you get the little polyominoes, the little different shapes. There's just something. There's a real sense of progression and growth, even though. I keep losing, so I'm not progressing in terms of a win. You just feel like you've built something. That's yeah. what I like. What do you like about it? Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I agree. I, I think I also like how a couple things. I like the, the action selection mechanism, how you can, with just one or two restrictions, can pretty much choose any action you want to take, but the longer you wait to take an action, uh, the more powerful it becomes. I think that's really clever. And, mm -hmm. and I also like how it's really designed well to give you kind of this little little steady stream of bonuses all the time. Yeah, I love that. It's like, you know, you just feel like you've got like a chain reaction almost every other turn or almost every turn. You'll do something and that gets you this bonus and that bonus allows you to do this. And I love that, you know, that kind of it feels fun and powerful. It feels neat. Mm -hmm. And um, then you've got the actual animals on there. Yeah. And so you're yeah. learning about them and there's some yeah. thought behind that. And yeah, um, yeah, yeah, true. True. It's really, and I really don't like the theme at all. Just because mm. I want to play a game, I usually want something escapist. I remember so it's said amazing that, yeah. how much I like it, given that the lack of robots, lasers, or you know, sorcerer supremes, or something. Like I just, I'm a child of the '80s, and yeah, I just yeah. really want you know something space driven. Yeah. And and that would if, be a cool a retheme of that game: space and robots and. Yeah, like what if yeah, you're collecting yeah. heroes from the marvel multiverse or something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so I, cool. I that would just really float my boat but i get that this is much more approachable to all sorts of people and i right. like the learning component and i really do like it it's, it's not that i don't i i'm actually surprised how much i like it given that you're like oh i have some birds yeah. like it's kind of lame in a way you're like oh <laughs> yeah and Koala. the fact that the fact that yeah as you said the, the fact that the theme doesn't speak to you quite as much as other themes really and yet you love it so much really indicates what a good game it is Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. there's not a um, adventure mystery thing to it. It no. really is no. sort of building building a zoo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that that's been fine. How, how, what about you? You know, I, uh, a game I've been trying out recently that I really, really love. It's an older one, but um, Hansa Teutonica. Okay. Um, we got the Hansa Teutonica big box over over Christmas, and Kristen got that for me, which I really appreciated. And I just, I really like it. Um, we talked before, you know, I kind of like, I kind of like Euro games, um, which is for maybe for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with the term, it just kind of means, you know, games where maybe a little bit less luck, a little bit kind of more strategy. And you, you, and you don't like, like move, conflict. Mo- yeah. Like moving little wooden cubes yeah. around or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, but what I like, but you know, the challenge with a lot of Euro games is they're often very, very long. And they have a lot of setup, a lot of teardown. Uh, but this doesn't have either of those things. It's a really thinky, strategic Euro game, but it's pretty short. Um, mm-hmm. It has very little setup time, very little teardown time. You don't have to put a lot of things on the board to set up. Um, and and um, and there is what I really like about this. And we talked about this before. You know, there's some what you might call negative player interaction, which is you do something. It maybe benefits you, but it harms the other person in some way. Mm-hmm. And as a general rule, I, you know, I, I'm not a super big fan of those. You know, I, I often end up kind of feeling guilty or whatever. But what I love about this is, you, you, uh, you, you, in this game, the negative player interaction, yeah, it benefits you and it does something negative to the other person. But whenever you do it to them, they get like this super bonus that actually benefits them even more than, I mean, it, not every turn, but often it benefits them even more than the bad thing you did to them. Mm-hmm. And so I really, I kind of, I don't, it, I don't have any, I have less qualms about doing it because what it means is that Poor I'm Daniel. actually helping this person a lot right. by doing this action. And it's really, it's fun. It's a really fun game. So I, I love Hansa Teutonica. It's, I, I'm eager to play it with some larger groups of people. Hmm. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's mine. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I've not tried it, but I've seen it talked about and I would love to try it. Next time we get together, yes, we have to do next time. Space Arc Nova and Hansa Teutonica in Space the Marvel cats. Universe. <laughs> well, back to our back to the book of games. Um, we're gonna close up the episode with just a little time here where Kevin and I just kind of share some responses to it, some reactions to it. Kind of go back and forth a little bit, um, Kevin. Would you like to begin? Any, any, what, what's one reaction takeaway that you had to the book of games? Well, yeah, one I have is that the medieval period they had fun. So I mm. think in our larger cultural imagination, it was very brutal or just super religious or you know like the Puritans almost. Or, we don't think about them being real human beings that were playing games and having, you know, romantic affairs, which is of what, you know, romantic events in their lives, like, which, which is what some of the images are depicting here, evidently that they, so like men are looking at women or they're playing games or there's jokes. So it just makes them very human. Mm -hmm. And, and I like that the colors, the liveliness, the different people from different walks of life. It's a, it's a rare glimpse of, of probably, you know, the medieval period was much more lively and interesting than we, we tend to depict it as cold castles and people walk around in muck and then getting killed in wars. And while that's right, true, right, it wasn't right. true for everybody. That's such a great point. Yeah, you're right. We, we remember, we remember what, what the historians record, you know, we remember the, the wars, the battles, the plagues, Mm-hmm. And the the day to day joys of living, for the most part, are not often written down. You know, like right playing games with your friends or things like that. Yeah, yeah. There was a, it's very adult show, but there was a show at one time I think on HBO or something called The Tudors, and it did a good job of this as well. That the castle was filled with tapestry and candles, and they were dancing and music, and it just made it feel very homey. And mm-hmm. when we mm-hmm. visit one of those castles today, the tapestries are rotted away. You know, we j- we don't have the things that would have made it alive. Yeah. So if yeah. you think of walking in a house that's not decorated, but, or all the decorations have have molded and gone away, it, it would be a very sad place. But that's not how they lived. 
That's such a great insight. I love that. I love that. And these are the people that created gargoyles. Like, they were fun. They were funny. They put gargoyles on their churches. They carved little monsters sticking their tongues out outside the churches. Yeah. Inside the churches, they made little jokes and images. Yeah. And the Green Man, which is like this weird myth in England, they they put those in their churches. They were like, eh, it's fine. You know, yeah. like they were not as hung up <laughs> as we are today, I think. They, right, they, they right. liked a good monster. They drew monsters in their books and dragons and mm. yeah, yeah. I think it's a oceans. cooler time to give them credit. That's what about really, you? What a great insight and and um and and a, a an insight that can't come from it just everyone, but from a thanks for sharing your church historian oh, eye on that. No, I love that. No, love it's that. just great. me watching stuff. No. Yeah. On a side note, you know, it's in the Iron Maiden, the supposedly medieval torture device. Yeah, Evidently, yeah. the Victorians just made that up. <laughs> really? Yes. So some of our ideas are what the Victorians thought. They sort of, they were entranced by the Middle Ages, but they made it into this thing that is not always accurate. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. The Victorian no, Great mindset. insight. Well, my first takeaway is related to that, I think very similar, you know, one of my first reactions to this book was how strange it, the concept of it, the premise of it would be if we applied it today. You know, like if, 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 mm. if, how would we react if a world leader, a president or a prime minister said, now I will produce a book about games? You know, just, right. just I mean, we can't even really fathom that, how strange that is. And I think, you know, and so I wonder, what does that say? You know, and, and I it could probably say a lot of things, maybe say a lot of things about us too, our, in our age. I think I may say something about Alfonso, and I would leave that to historians much more learned than I about what it says about Alfonso, but maybe, you know, his approach to learning and uh, ecumenism and things like that. But, and, but I think it also says something, this, and this is kind of what relates something to your point, about games and the role of games in, at that time period, that there's a certain kind of value and respect placed upon them that... Um, might surprise us today, you know, like um, mm. um, that they were important enough for a head of state to produce a whole book about, you know, right. whereas wow. today we think they're just throwaway. We think, ah, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure probably some of our listeners have this experience and, you know, maybe you too, Kevin, I, I may mention to someone that I'm really into board games. And it's, a lot of times people are really interested and fascinated, but a lot of times people kind of like, like kind of choked down a, a giggle, you know, it's kind of like, mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem serious enough for, you know, for, uh, for our world today. But I love that. I mean, it was important enough for a head of state to write a book about, about, mm -hmm. and, um, the, um, and that gets back to what I was mentioning earlier. That one particular population that I think was absent from those illustrations, at least I don't remember. So don't quote me on this. You might go back into the book and find this and I might be wrong, but at least for the most part, those illustrations and in his writings, there's very little said about children playing games. I don't Ooh, recall that in pictures. I don't recall that in, about it's that. all about adults playing games. Yeah, you're right. And so, you know, and he's, whereas today, I think, you know, we'd have to almost kind of offer this apologetic games can be for adults too, things like that, uh, because we think primarily of children today, but then, but he didn't, that wasn't even an issue. It's like mm -hmm. a whole book about adults playing games. And it was important enough for a head of state to write it. And right. I just, I think it's really cool. Right. So that's yeah. And that's take. just what's popular in our culture that, that right now, or it's how our culture views things. So, so yeah. games are, and, and even comic books are thought of as more for children. Yeah. Although all the Marvel movies have kind of shown that's not quite true because lots of adults are buying tickets and enjoying them. Yeah. But yeah. but yeah, we label it that way. But meanwhile, things such as sports, like American football, that's okay to watch, even though that's right. just another game. Right. And half of it's commercials anyway. But yeah, but that's yeah. socially acceptable. But to play games is seen as strange. But you're right. Yeah, it's so interesting. Uh, huh. I, that's a thank you. Thank you. That's yeah. And I've been revisiting Bernard Suits, and one of his arguments is games are not just about leisure from work. Games are, you know, as I've revisited it, that that's the takeaway for mm. part of what the Grasshopper is in that wonderful book that that. If we think of games as just an escape from work, then we're missing the point of what games are. They are an end unto themselves. And Correct. They're an end unto yeah, themselves. Yeah. yeah. That's such a great book. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I, I, the more I come back, you know, a great book when the more you revisit it, the more you like it. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, what about yeah, you? No, you're absolutely right. Away? There well, aren't kids. You. There aren't kids. In fact, there's nobility and there's kings and mm -hmm. military guys depicted um, mm -hmm. playing. There's mm -hmm. men and women playing, which mm -hmm. you know, that was mm -hmm. a rare way for the sexes to mingle, mm -hmm. and uh, various races and peoples and religions. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't care about your God. Let's play chess, that's right? right? We can come right. together around chess and, and, um, exactly. And, yeah. And we may and, not be able to come together in how we worship, but we can come together over a game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Well, yeah. So how about you, Kevin? Yeah. What's, what's, what's another takeaway you have? Gosh. Um, I like how it's so inclusive. So it does show various mm. people from walks of life. And he even starts out the book saying, Hey, there's different kinds of fun activities, and some of them involve, say, hunting. But let's point out, as the book says, or as, as this book of games, some people can't hunt because they may be women, or they're older, or they're sick, or it's nighttime. So games are a way that we can enjoy gaming, and it's more accommodating of everybody. So it yeah. kind of states that from the start. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. You're connecting yeah. it to falconry and hunting which is or you know that's a kind of gaming situation where you you follow certain rules but the outcome's uncertain but it, then he's saying that these games are even better than sports mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than hunting for him because that yeah they're more open and inclusive and accessible to yeah to folks yeah yeah. yeah, and he, he names all the different people that can participate in a way that yeah. that's for you know. Once it goes, once it's dark, you can't really hunt unless you get flashlights. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that section where he says like, it, um, even if you're in prison, you can play games, and even he says like, even if you're on a ship in the middle of a storm, you can play yes. games. You know, yes, like, no matter what, you can play games. I it love could get that. tricky during a storm though. Check no, and the board slides off. <laughs> where, where, where did my elephant go? No, where there did it my elephant go? <laughs> it's on my bottom. How did I sit on my elephant? Wait, and then you have four elephants. I'm not cheating, sir. <laughs> All these elephants underneath your chair. <laughs> That's a great insight. Yeah, yeah. He he really does celebrate that at the beginning, doesn't he? Just how. How uh -huh. open and accessible and inclusive. There is a love that comes through it. Yeah. And who yeah, actually yeah. wrote it, whether the king, you know, he just right. put his stamp on it. But it's still, it, it is a celebration in a lot of ways. And, and yeah, yeah I, 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 those points, you know, from 740 years or whatever, 740 years beyond the grave, they still yeah. resonate with us today. That, that's just awesome. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Thank you, Kevin. I love it. I love it. Yep. You got um, one more? Yeah. You know what? Actually, I, I, I'll, I'll, I've got, I had a couple of others, but I'm going to, but one of them was just what you said. So I'm going to skip over that one. But I had also mm -hmm. that point that just, I love how he said, you know, that just how accessible games are that the, above every other kind of form of entertainment, they are the most accessible, accessible to the most people. Um, I guess the only other one I had then was just talking about, um, he begins by talking about um, games are a reflection of God's de of God's desire for us and for the world, and I just and I love kind of that mm. theological grounding at the beginning. I, I I I may quote a little bit here, but you know, he starts off by saying, "Because God wanted that man, we might we'd say human beings today, because God wanted the human beings have every manner of happiness in God naturally, so or 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 in ourselves naturally, so that." Uh, human beings could suffer the cares and troubles when they come to them. Therefore, mm. humans have sought out many ways that they could have this happiness completely. And wherefore, they found and made many types of play. And then goes on to oh, that's illustrate awesome. types of play and then says, games are the best. Or sitting games. He said, sitting games are the most accessible. And I, I love that grounding at the very beginning that this isn't a um, this isn't something outside of God's dream for humanity or um, um, you know, intent for the human experience, but that games are and play are this essential part that God has dreamed for us from the beginning. Uh, Alonzo said, Alf I'm sorry, Alfonso said, as a way to relieve suffering, things like that. And certainly that's true. I think, as we've talked about in other episodes, I think, I think we might argue it's more than just to relieve suffering, but that's certainly a big part of it. 
But it um, also says to prepare, right? As if it helps you deal with that. Mm, so it may not. Mm. I've wondered in that text there. Is it meaning you are distracted from the suffering, or does it mean you understand the suffering a little better because you've, right? Mm. Like you've, it's sort of conditioned you to. Mm. That's I don't really know. good. That's really good. Yeah, that's where you we would need a scholar to really pick apart the text. But yeah, no, I'm with you. That's that's quite a vision of what gains can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the other one. That was that was the main other one I had. We've touched okay. upon the couple others I had. How, how about you? Do you have anything else? I, I the scholarly article commented about how the images include humor and gesture and even some bits like the evil eye, like somebody's mm. taking a move and someone's trying to, you know, like avoid bad luck or something. I, the, the, there's a lot of stuff in the images that's very interesting that um, <laughs> there's even some hints that there might have been this story or urban legend that somebody is, if they win the game, they get the girl. So there's some okay. idea that some of that's going on. So that's why a woman is watching kind of fearfully the game because she doesn't know if her true love is going to be able to win her. Okay. Um, okay. So there's some huh. women. So people aren't. So so in the images, they're looking in interesting places. They might be looking at the winner of the game. They might be looking at someone else. They might be looking at the play. They might be like what's about to happen. So there's there's a lot of um, the artwork is very intentional. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. sometimes the winner is being served refreshments, and that's a okay. clue of who's going to win the game. I see, I see. That's I missed what that. The, that's so cool. Yeah, that that's a long and deep article, but it's very interesting how yeah. she picks apart the significance of the artwork. I appreciate your having shared that with me. Yeah, thank yeah, you. A lot of it's guesswork, but that it's it's it's. Yeah. Um, there's a lot going. It's not just pictures, as well as the cool bit that that um. They they blow they almost do like a blowout of the board so the yes. perspective is wrong so yes. but the point is you can see the board and what they're doing yeah yeah so it's yeah it's not just an illustration of yeah. the events it's you can actually analyze the gameplay yeah Very yeah every cool. illustration is kind of like what we might call like an overhead camera today for like yeah. the, the content yeah creators, picture in games. picture yeah. overhead camera yeah they're yeah. doing that in the middle ages so again these yeah. were crafty clever smart people they may have thought the world was flat they you know they didn't understand nuclear fission and fusion but heck what they knew and they could do they they did it well so yeah yeah tip of the hat to them absolutely absolutely yeah it was that, that's a, a a great point. Yeah, I mm. freak, I I remember there was one illustration where they were like uh, uh men were playing a dice game and I think they were like stripped down to their pants or something and the and the caption said like like or the scholarly analysis like this indicates they were gambling in this game and they've lost all their clothes. Like, they were, <laughs> yeah, they yes, were, yes. Yeah, yeah they've bet everything <laughs> down to their clothes. Yeah, yeah. that's really yeah. funny. They're yeah. like, oh I gotta win it back. Let me take yeah, my shirt yeah. off. Give yeah, me back my no, tunic awesome. or whatever. Or, yeah. Yeah, and then the king, you, you just can picture the king like, well, show me your latest page. And he's like, oh, that's really funny, dude. Dude, <laughs> right, bra, right, right. bra, that's funny. Bra. Right. All well, right. Well, that's great, Kevin. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great insights from you. Um, this was your idea, actually, and I would never have gone as in depth without your prodding. Well, I'm so glad I did. Thank you. Well, you're kind. Thank you. And I, I, I should, I appreciate that. I should give due credit to. If, if you're interested in learning more about this kind of subject, um, there's a book called um, Parlette's History of Board Games by David Parlette. I'm holding up to the video, though. I know you can't see it. You're listening to the podcast. Um, and um, this is formerly the Oxford History of Board Games. And it's just jam-packed with all sorts of this kind of stuff. But oh, wow. he regularly cites Alfonso's manuscript in the book as this really invaluable resource for understanding medieval games. So yeah, if you'd like to learn more, Parlette's History of Board Games is Excellent. where I first learned about it too. So, and I'll link the videos I was discussing about Victorian board games down below. Great. So great. Link Thank you. Parlette's. Yes. Yeah. And next week, next, next week. Yes. What's coming uh, um, next episode. I'm really excited about. And I, um, Kevin, do you want to share it? Do you want me to? Because I know it's, you've been working on it more than I have, but I can. I well, can I was it. setting you up to announce. Okay, it. okay, I'm excited. Well, we have a special guest next next week. Um, 
we are welcoming a, 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 another podcaster who has who also explores religion and board games frequently. Um, Dan Thoreau. Dan Thoreau. Am I saying his name right there, Kevin? I don't know if it's Thoreau or Thorot. I've heard it. Okay. At least said Thorot, but I'm not sure. We're, we're, we're going to find out. Okay. Well, I apologize if Dan is listening yeah. and I mispronounced your name. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, Kevin, you've reached out to him and he's, he's going to be a, a part of our, of our episode and, um, and, and next week. And, and he's going to be talking about, um, um, board games as as devotion and and some other subjects as yeah, well talk about his religious yeah, what, what, background what and things he does a great newsletter website and podcast called space biff b-i-f-f mm -hmm. it evidently mm -hmm. comes from you know the comic books and they punch each other like pal biff bam so it's like what would that sound like in space so space biff i think is <laughs> it, it, it's a, a very unique and cool name. So he, yeah, he's a well-respected reviewer and thinker online, and we're excited to hear from him. Yeah, another looking Daniel. forward to it. Oh. Yes, and um, and if people want to get a hold of us, Kevin, what are some ways that people can can interact with us? We are on Instagram, Board Game Faith. We've got an awesome newsletter that has lots of nice little tidbits. It comes out every other week. And you can sign up for that through our link tree. It's the easiest way, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash board game faith dot net slash Daniel is awesome dot com. Semicolon. Semicolon. Kevin is mailed. even awesomer. <laughs> Hyper slash mail to colon info at boardgamefaith.com. So you can also just email us. So check us out there, Instagram and the newsletter. Emails come out every other week. And um, yeah, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate your um, um, giving up a little bit of your time every day to, to hang out with us and think about history of board games and God. And um, we, we appreciate you all more than we can say. Thank you so much.